Okay, welcome to the show, guys. And today we have a living legend. As I said, I always love celebrating these people while they're here with us so that we can talk to them and hear the stories, not wait till it's an obituary and a tribute way down the line. So those that have been following the series know that this is about in conversation with musical legends. And today we have none other than Madeline Bell. <laughs> now those who know, know who this lady is, okay? And was one of the first faces that you were seeing on UK TV, stylish, black, dark skinned woman, natural hair, all the things that we looked up to. And the wigs. Well, we yeah. didn't talk about the wigs yet. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> the wigs that, that are now in fashion, we were wearing those in the 60s. Oh, back in the 60s, you know? for sure. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, you are definitely one of those images that when you were watching TV, but that I can remember from towards the end of the 60s and 70s, you were somebody to aspire to mm -hmm. as a Black person because... Yeah. I can remember the few that you saw on TV were yourself and Pearly Gates. Yep. Viola Billups. That's my you know, girl. That's absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, there are two people that you saw that actually, it sounds like a cliche, but you can say, look like you, look like the people in your family, look yeah. like people that you knew. And you thought, you know what? Yeah, I want a bit of that microphone business myself and those <laughs> psychedelic colors, you know? I don't necessarily yeah. want to work on the buses or the trains or the tubes or the yeah. whatever. You yeah. know? So you guys really were icons that made the younger generation aspire to you and think that, yeah, this is possible. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, Pearlie is one of my favorite people because she's got so much style. Absolutely. Up yeah. until up until last week, which was her birthday. Her birthday, I yeah. Her, yeah, last not yeah. last week, Sunday, Sunday before. And um, you know, she still got it going on. So, yeah. you know. But let's hear Madeline's story. Okay. So you're from New York, New New, New Jersey. York, New Jersey, Newark. That's I'm it. from the city of singers. Um yeah, absolutely. I was born and raised in Newark and uh, sang in the choirs, every choir in church and in school. And I always call Newark the city of singers because uh, my best friend, my mother's best friend was Sarah Vaughn. Okay. Who grew up in Talk Newark. Talk about aim high. <laughs> yeah. And um, my choir used to compete on the fourth Sunday of every month with the New Hope Baptist Church Choir, which consisted of... Dion Warwick, Dee Dee Warwick, Sissy Houston, and the Drink Art Singers. Okay. So this was long before uh, Whitney was even thought of, right? This was yeah, in the early yeah, yeah. days. Yeah, so that's the kind of um, surroundings I had, you know, growing up in church. And we well, had you know, like is, you wouldn't it believe. It seems to be the common denominator. When I've spoken to most of the singers, it all seemed to have, well, not always, but predominantly seemed to have started from church. Yep. It yep. seems to be the place of the schooling, the vocal schooling. Yep. Church. Church. And we didn't have microphones in those days, so you had to project. You know, so, I mean, to this, this day, I'm louder than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, as you say, you had the backing, you had the background training in church. As you say, you had to project your voice almost like an opera singer because yeah. opera, singers, opera singers don't have microphones. They just have their voice and lungs yeah. and diaphragm, yeah. you know, yeah. so that's the school that you come from. Yeah. So when did music become the serious thing for you or was it always that for you from church? Well, I mean, I, I, I always wanted to sing, I had two choices. I wanted to be a, a children's nurse, um, um, like a children's nanny. That was always okay. my dream because I always loved babies and kids and everything. And the other was that I wanted to be a singer. Well, I, I was expelled from school when I was 16. So that put an end to my dream of being a nurse, but it kept me going as far as wanting to be a singer. And I, like I said, I was in every choir in school and every choir that I could be in, in church as well. 
And mm -hmm. then uh, I, when I was I, I was in a couple of um, street corner doo wop groups, um, and then I was asked to join a, a group called the Glover Tones when I was sixteen. I left school okay. but, and got a job. I got a job the same day I left school. And uh, I used to work five days a week. And then over the weekend, we would all find four girls and, and um, Kenneth Glover, who was the, the lead singer in the group, and Reverend Green, who was the preacher, and Kenneth Glover's mother. We would all get in the car. She, The mother, uh, Mother Glover was that we called her. She <laughs> I was love that, our, Mother Glover. Mother Glover, she was our chaperone. And we would go drive in this white, Plymouth station wagon from Newark to North Carolina to do okay. sing in the church on on Sunday and then leave the church and then drive all the way back all night long through you know and like we did gigs driving through the south in the early days so I learned a lot <laughs> yeah well I mean it's nothing like the foundation of practical training not yeah. theoretical you were in it you were doing it you were yeah. learning I, I was, the tricks of the trade yeah. yeah, and uh, I learned a lot of when we went down south, you know, I, I learned, well, not a lot, but I learned enough um, about the attitude of um, the, the south. The so um, I was yeah. glad, I was glad of where I came from. And when I got the chance in 1962 to come to Europe, I took the chance. And uh, So how music, did that come about? How did that chance and opportunity come about? Well, I left the Glover Tones um, because we had been singing for a week at a revival meeting, they called it. Yeah. And at the end of it, we were given five dollars each. And I just thought I could have stayed home and made more money than that, even at 16, 17 years old. Right. So um, I left the, the, the group and uh, I went to see. Uh, a, a, here a gospel program of which Alec, Professor Alex Bradford was on and his singers. And he saw me and he said, you're that singer. Uh, he said, you want to join my group? Well, cause he'd heard about me through, you know, through the gospel grape, grapevine. Right. And so I joined Alex Brantford and uh, he was really popular at the time as well. And this consisted of a group of five guys and me. And they were like my, my bodyguards. <laughs> <laughs> And um, uh, we played all down south and as far down as New Orleans. I mean, we really went went south. And that's when I really got some some lessons. I traveled on the Greyhound, double-decker Cena Cruiser bus, all the way from Newark, two days and two nights to New Orleans. But we came back in a car. And uh, so we had some experiences there. But anyway... I love uh, the way you're doing this whole thing with your eyes closed. I love it. Yeah, it's a video. That's because I'm, I'm picturing it. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. You can see you're picturing it to bring it back and tell the story. I do I do the same thing when I'm singing. I always, you know, I mean, I don't stand there with my eyes closed the whole time. But when I'm trying to picture something, I have to close my eyes because the picture becomes very clear. Yeah. To me, right? Anyway, um, and so we were signed up to Alex Bradford and uh, he he went and got a, a manager. Uh, and this manager in, within a couple of weeks came with a script for a musical called Black Nativity. And, right. the man and he was the manager at the time of a, a writer named Langston Hughes. Wow. And Langston Hughes had written Black Nativity. I actually That's met right. him. Yeah. 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 And uh, so we did the, we opened Off-Broadway in 1961, uh, November, December, 1961 in Black Nativity. The Alex Bradford, Alex Bradford and the Bradford Singers and Marion Williams and the Stars of Faith. And uh, it, it ran for, uh, I think we did it for four weeks. And on the last night, this impresario from Italy came to the producers and said, uh, I'd like to take the show to, Italy for the Spoleto Festival next year, which was June in Spoleto. So they did the deal and off we left in June and came to Europe for what was supposed to be six weeks. And we stayed, um, uh, we did four weeks in Italy, came to London for two weeks to record it. And then another producer, Empresario, came to the producers and said, I'd like to put the show on in London. Wow. So we played the Criterion 
theater in London. Yeah, in two shows. A, yep, two shows a night for two weeks. And after that, um, we were supposed to go, but it just snowballed, and we stayed, and we stayed, uh, we stayed until August nineteen sixty three. Wow. We managed to go home to do one gig. We played Lincoln Center. And then we came back to Europe and we were in Europe for, for 15, 14 months instead of six weeks. And then um, while we were performing in the fourth theater that Black Nativity had played, which was the Strand, a uh, guy came backstage and introduced himself as Norman Newell. And he was a record producer from EMI and he wanted to sign me up, offered me a recording contract. So? And the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, and the rest is history. And Norman Newell at the time was, or had been, the producer of Shirley Bassey and Danny Williams. So he was like, uh, he handled the black acts, basically. Okay. And uh, so I was signed to EMI. And like you say, the rest is history. I went home told my grandmother and my grandmother said honey opportunities rarely knocks more than once she said you go she said if it doesn't work out you know you got a home to come back to you could always come been, back that's right and, and I came back uh on the 11th of September September 11th 1963 and I've been in Europe ever since really yeah because, well, how long did you spend in London then? Because this is where I really know you from. I don't really know you from Black Nativity. That was before my time. But I definitely know you from the Blue Mink days. That was 1969. I'd already been in London for six years. Right. By then, I, I lived, in, lived in London for 37 years. Oh, right. As long as that. Yeah, and I got my first recording. Uh, uh, my, I did the American basses for a start. You know, I mean that was real dues paying. You know, I did the American basses in the UK as well as Germany. I covered Germany as well. There were there was a lot of basses over there at that time. Right. And uh, and uh, I got a, a, um, a spot on this program. It was called Ready Steady Go. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Ready, Steady, Go, everybody did that show. And I got a chance to do it as well, which uh, uh, meant that I was invited to the New Year's Eve party. So on New Year's Eve 1964, uh, I met Dusty Springfield at the party. And she, once again, she said words to the effect, you're the singer I've heard about. Do you want to do you want to do a session? And I didn't know what a session was, but I said, yeah, because I was starving. I had nothing. All, all I had was the, the American basis. Anyway, I gave her my number. And two days later, I got a call and was booked um, to do a session for her backing vocal. And uh, I had just been to the Social Security office and had to get cards and all of this and but then went and, and had auditioned or um, for a job at a cinema working 11 hours a day, six days a week for six guineas, one guinea wow. a day. Yeah. That was average pay. I mean, yeah. the hours were long, but that was average pay at that time. Six guineas a week. Got home and there was a message on my door. I rang the, the number that was on this message and it was Johnny Franz, Dusty's manager. And he said, this is the same day, right? They okay. booked me to do this session to the, like the next day or the day afterwards. And my fee for three hours was six guineas. Yeah, and you thought, that's it. <laughs> I thought, there we go. <laughs> yeah, that's it. No question. And so that was my, I can't, I can't remember what song it was. A lot of people say it was middle of nowhere, but I'm not sure if it was that. I don't think it was that. Right. Anyway, so that was my first session with so Dusty. So the session with Dusty. Yeah. And then that led to? Snowballed. Yeah. Just snowballed. It snowballed to within, well, like within a year, I was doing three sessions a day, based almost seven, six, seven days a week. Wow. Seriously. So... <laughs> But I got to. Oh, it was when you got great. your first. When you were signed first, 
Did you have a single as a solo artist? Yes, I had a single and I'd gotten a spot on Ready Steady Go, but this, right. nothing, nothing happened with, with the, the single. The single but right. I got, got a lot of work. I having met Dusty, I, my turnover as far as work was concerned, it just went, it just snowballed. I was See, that's why I love these stories because, and I repeat it probably every time I do one of these interviews, but they are inspirational because it just shows you when opportunity meets preparation. Because you've done the preparation from church, the touring all over yeah. America, down south, coming to London. And then yeah. when the opportunity came, you were ready. You yeah. knew that when you went into that studio to do the BVs for Dusty, that yeah. you'd be on point and probably sound better than her. But well, you know, yeah, the thing is, I was, I, of course, I was really nervous because I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was told what to sing. And thankfully, um, having sung with Alex Bradford as a group, I mean, of course, I could harmonize and everything. And it, it all just worked out worked out great because yeah. the only singers uh, um, in London at the time were the Breakaways, who, who were great ladies, and they were on my very first recording session, the, the Breakaways, and I loved right. them, loved them all. They were so nice, nice, you know, and, and it was the first time I'd spent any real time with white people. Oh, really? In the yeah, as far as singing and everything was concerned, because I don't always been a gospel singer before then. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then it was the, the breakaways, and then uh, Mike Sam singers. They were all the straight singers who were readers, as we call them. You know, they could all they could pick up a piece of music and read it straight away. Me and the other two singers that I was working with, we didn't read music, but we yeah. learned how yeah. to have a quick yeah. ear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dusty, uh, who we worked for most of all, she wasn't interested in whether you could read or not. Her thing was if you got an ear. Can yeah. you hear it? Yeah. Yeah. And she used to do sessions with us as well. She used to yeah. come and do sessions. She's on she's on um quite a few of my early tracks. Right. Yeah. You see, <laughs> I I love these stories. For me, I think they're absolute gold because as you see, the journey wasn't easy and it was long. But when you now tell the story, it was worth it. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what, you know, we have to kind of pass on to the others and say, yeah. well, you know what, if you want to get into this, it's not easy. The journey is long, but it's worth it. Yeah, but I mean, now we live in an in, in age of um, uh, Britain's got talent, America's got, everybody's got talent. So um, if they win that, they don't even have to win to become popular you know they can become popular in their own area making a living um but they haven't paid their dues yeah and that's the thing that i think about all the time these people who win first of all uh what kind of contract have they got with with um simon cowell 10-year contract any money they, they can't go nowhere they can't do anything without him you know yeah. I, I just think you got to learn those lessons because that's what we call the small print absolutely yeah, yeah. And you know, a lot, a lot of, us, of them are one minute wonders. They have yeah. the one single and then you don't hear anything from yeah. them after that. Whereas, you know, people like yourselves and the Pearlies and, and the others and the Dusties, you had singles, albums that were yeah. through decades and yeah. you can still pick them up now and play them and sound good. I'll tell you, I've, I've been in my car, I've been playing a, um, a recording of Blue Mink live at the top of the town. This wow. was in about 1972. And it was so good. Yeah. I'm really proud of that, considering that we did that what uh 50 years ago, nearly. The band was so tight and everything, and all the guys, they were all we were all studio people, all of us. Blue Mink was was fluke. So yeah, the, I want to hear about Blue Mink. How did Blue Mink come about? Well, I got a call from Roger Coulomb, who was the keyboard, the original keyboard player in, in Blue Mink. He was the one who played on that track, uh, Je T'aime. Dee, 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 yeah, dee. yeah. That's Roger Coulomb. And because uh, we all knew each other, because we saw in those days, um, everything was recorded at the same time. They didn't uh, dub in and track on stuff afterwards. Everything, even strings, everything was recorded at the same time. So it meant that we would see um, the same musicians 
sometimes twice a day. Yeah. And so Roger Coolum phoned me and said um, that he and three other musicians had been um, recording an album and uh, it was all instrumental and they thought it might be a bit boring without some vocals. So would I come along and do some vocals, which I did. Right. Uh, and went in, did it, you know, like uh, an hour later I was gone. And a couple of days later, he rang me back again and said, Roger Cook has written this song and we think it'd be good as a duet if you and Roger did it together for the album, will you do it? And I said, yeah. So we go in, we record the song, which was Melting Pot. And we're standing, uh, we did like three takes of it and that was it. We went back and we're listening to it. And one of the guys said, we need to, we should put this out as a single. Do you want to join the group? And me and Roger just looked at each other and thought, yeah, we've got nothing to lose. You know, we, so we did. Wow. And so in actual fact, you recording this song is what made them ask you to join the group. Yeah, they were See, really these knocked are out. The with stories the we need to know. <laughs> yeah, and they were they were knocked out with the one track, and and uh, if they put the track out, then of course they would need us to be there to promote. So we just and in those days there was a lot of that going on. I mean, one um, fellow singer, his name is Tony Burroughs, Tony uh, English, white guy, great singer, and he was on. Uh, he was the lead singer of. Um, Love grows where my rosemary goes. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But that's Tony Burroughs. But he he was on like uh, in the top twenty. He'd be on three of the lead singer because he'd been booked as a session. Same thing. Right. Go along, do the lead vocal, and then they put it out, and it's a hit. And at one point, he did top of the pops, and he had to go and change three times because he was in three different bands. Of three different bands. 20. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God he didn't mix up the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. so Blue Mink, how did that come to an end? What happened with that? Well, we worked a lot. We had a few, uh, you know, a few top 30 hits and um, we all got on really well. I mean, the survivors of, of the, there's only four of us left. Me, right. Roger, um, me, Roger, Herbie and Alan of the originals. Okay. And, uh, and uh, Anne O'Dell, who, who took over from the original keyboard player, Roger Coolum. So we're still alive. We're all still friends, and I still love them all, because when we um, decided to split um, four and a half years later, that was May 1974, we split. Right. And it was mutual. A, we had a, record, uh, uh, um, a manager who was ripping us off. And he'd gone off to America and had gone off and, and, and had collected some of our fee in cash from a club that we were working in and we hadn't even performed. And then he'd gone off to do some business in America. So we found out when we got there. So we just decided, yeah, let's do it now. We can, you know, we can do one of those to him. Because <laughs> uh, we were all okay because we were still working our butts off aside from doing the clubs and things we were driving coming off stage in Liverpool or Manchester and driving down to London for 10 o'clock in the morning and still doing sessions because we didn't want to give up our bread and butter because yeah. we knew all of us had been in the business long enough to know that it wasn't going to last forever absolutely so, but we had we had a good run you know we 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 um uh we actually toured New Zealand because one of us tracks was got to number two in the charts down there so we toured there and, and we went to California we played the Troubadour um, that launched uh, Jimi Hendrix in the States and Elton John and Elton John was actually there and introduced us on stage and Dusty was there and one of the Beach Boys was there and you know uh, but we had a good time and while it lasted we had a good time but we just decided yeah that's and I think that's quite important what you say there because you, you know as you say everything has its time yeah and you have to kind of see and preempt that not wait till the time is there then yeah. to to try to make and choices. Also, and also there was another reason because Blue Mink had done a capital radio started I don't know when it was 73 and uh, in London and Blue Mink did all of these station ideas 
Isn't it good to know? Capital Radio, all of that capital helps you make it through. All of that is Blue Me and me and You're Roger joking. Cook. Capital yeah. in tune to London. Yeah, That's yeah, not, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Blue Mink, all of that. Yeah, I all remember that. That they would play in the evening. Um, Dave Cash, bless his heart. He was a great fan and a great friend, and he got us to, to do all of that. And, of course, when we did that, the BBC didn't like it, and they stopped playing our music. Oh, really? That was another reason why we decided to, to split. And Roger Cook, who had written most of uh, the stuff that we did, Cook and Greenaway, um, the BBC stopped playing anything written by Cook and Greenaway, which is, you know, really I mean, it was, it was really, really petty. And um, so we just decided, well, we're not having, not getting any records played on, on the BBC. And Capital Radio was playing that stuff all the time. I mean, Dave Cash even had um, Good Morning Freedom as his, his um, theme song. His the theme song. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. Yeah. So, but Blooming, we had we we knew that it was time for us to like call it a day, you know. And so all what the guys, came for you after that? I I went back to doing the clubs because I had been doing the clubs in the in the sixties before Blooming, and then started doing uh, sessions. Right. So, um, because doing the clubs, you know, um, traveling up north, oh, oh God, that was really difficult in the winter. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, see, I God. love these closed eyes and. Oh. Yeah. Reliving every moment of <laughs> traveling in the snow, in the cold, oh, in the yes. west. I can see yes. it. And um, my my first club, going back now and I'm thinking about it, was um, my first cabaret date was in May 1964. And it was in a club called La Dolce Vita in Newcastle okay. upon Tyne. And top of the bill was Lionel Blair and his dancers. Second on the bill was me. Third on the bill was a new comedian uh, whose name was Les Dawson. Oh, yeah. Good <laughs> old Les. Time, Good and old every Les. Time I, every time I saw Les after that, until he died, he used to say, oh, you remember those days in Newcastle? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. Yeah. You started to sound like him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I loved him. I, I love this. Brilliant he, comedian. Brilliant beautiful character. Guy. Yeah. Brilliant yeah, comedian. very, very talented. So when did you decide to move to Spain? Oh, that came much, much later. Um, okay. the, I, I was going right through the uh, 70s. I went back to doing um, uh, cabaret as well as doing sessions. Uh, and I probably did more sessions because people knew my voice. I mean, there were times when if there was five commercials on in a break, three of them would be me. Yeah. And sometimes me and Tony Burroughs, because the two of us, we just sort of and took it's over. funny because you know the voice. Yeah. You're sitting down and you're watching the TV and the commercials yeah. come on and you're thinking, that voice sounds familiar, but I can't place it necessarily. But yeah. you know you know the voice. Yeah, oh, well, I, I sold everything from Brook Bond Dividend D. I can do it on Monday morning. Struggling out of bed and morning. Didn't get home till a quarter to three. I can do it with a D. <laughs> uh, oh, dear. McDonald's, I did oh, three or four different products at, from McDonald's when, when they first opened up. I did every, everything. Gas. The gas people are your people, everything. I mean, uh, just juice. I've, I've got an award up there from that uh, was definitely you. No yeah. additives, the, uh, 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 just, the, the, the juice. just that yes. was definitely yeah. you. I, I oh, knew yeah. that at the time. I was like, yeah. that's Madeline Bell. I know that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I did. Oh, yeah. But it was that was like because... a proper vocal for this <laughs> juice advert. It was proper vocals. <laughs> yes. So, was that, <laughs> No, that's definitely Madeline Bell. I can remember. Yeah, that it. was definitely me. Yeah, uh, those were really, really uh, good things though to do because in those days, um, you would go in and do the demo, and if they approved it, then you go back and do the the vocal, which was usually only sixty seconds, because uh, they were commercials. Sixty seconds, yeah. then you might do uh, uh, 
a 30 second version as well for short commercial. And, but the great thing was that, and you got paid for that. And then once it was on, every time it played, you got paid. So I used to sit, I would watch nothing but ITV so that I could see my yeah. commercials. See when you're getting paid. <laughs> yeah. And when the commercials would come on and one of mine would come on, it would just be ding. <laughs> 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 but no, sorry, things have changed since then. They do buyouts and then they, yeah. They, uh, uh, yeah. But you see, that's how everything started to go after a while because they probably thought we're paying out too much money. Yeah. So, you know, even for commercials that you do before, you would get paid however much per commercial. But yeah. then it became, well, the buyout fee, if you're used wherever, is this. And yeah. Thinking, well, it looks like it's a large sum of money. But if this commercial is running globally and nonstop, I would be being paid much more than this. Yeah. If you know, we were on the old contract. But yeah, I can remember when this buyout business started to come in. Yeah, and, um, and also you couldn't you couldn't really refuse because you know that they could replace you like that. Yeah, I think that's so, kind of what they had hanging over you. Yeah, we and also we did, um, at one point in the 70s, there was a, um, a musician's union strike in America. So they came over to London to record. So I did a few things for American, you know, like um, Toyota and Pepsi, Pepsi Cola, and, and, and they would pay you on the spot. They'd pay you, give you a check straight away and you could take it to the Chase Manhattan Bank in Barclay Square and, and cash it straight away. So we were all quite happy, <laughs> me, me and Tony Burroughs, there was, I can yeah. see him, yeah, yeah, wow. so. So well, are you, you still know, in I mean, touch with those guys? Yeah, on, on Facebook and Messenger, I'm, I'm still in touch with so many people that I worked with in the early days, of, you know, the ones who are still with us. Right. We stay in contact because we always prom we promised ourselves at the last couple of funerals that we were with, we yeah. let's wait until it's a funeral to see each to other. get together. And yes. I think we all do that at funerals. We yes. all do that at funerals. We go, why do we only make the effort when it's a funeral? You know? Well, what I, what I usually do is uh, before, you know, now with the pandemic, I haven't, I haven't left my home. I mean, I, I haven't worked since February of last year. Right. I have been on a plane or, or pa packed or opened a suitcase. It's, um, I have done, opened a suitcase because I've done a couple of gigs here in Spain. Right. But I haven't been out of Spain at all. Right. Um, so um, when I do go to London, I let all of my friends know. And usually there's a group of us and we meet at Selfridges uh, Brasserie and have salt beef sandwiches. Because <laughs> 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 they, do, they do great salt beef salt sandwiches. Beef sandwich. Yeah, the salt yeah. beef downstairs, ground floor. That's right. Yeah. So that's what, that's what we do. We, we meet up. And if I'm working, then I see them as well. Right. The last, time, the last time I worked in London was um, 2019 when I did the 60th anniversary of Ronnie Scott's. Okay. At uh, at the Albert Hall, that was that was really really good. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. But I definitely remember the Madeline Bell style, the earrings, the skull oh. cap. Yeah. That the skull cap was the thing. It was. Because that was completely different. As you said, yeah. it was all about either natural hair. Yeah. But it was slightly before Afro. Oh, look at it now. But, yeah. Um, you got your own gray. natural Afro, darling. Natural yeah. Afro. And I used but, to uh, I used to color it. I was blonde for a while, for a couple of years. And with this this um lockdown, I haven't of course haven't been able to get back to London to get the stuff that I need. And I just decided I ain't even gonna worry about it. At my age, I should have gray hair. So I've just decided to Absolutely. just let it grow out. Yeah. There you see it, guys, the natural yeah. Madeline Bell. Yeah, that's me. A full head of thick hair. See it right there. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, this is me. No <laughs> makeup, no nothing. No makeup. The put natural some lipstick on. Madeline Bell. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I think it's all about the nails, really. It's all about yeah. the nails. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, what's in store for Madeline? When is she coming back to London? 
Because uh -huh. most people have been stranded like yourself. All the artists I've spoken to, you know, no, I can't wait till things open back up. They might be doing things locally in their area. Yeah. But as regards international travel, you know, that's all kind of put off until 2022 at the earliest, really. Well, I've got a couple of things in Spain uh, uh, on my birthday, which it was just coincidental. Um, next week, I'm doing um, a gig in Tormelinos in the, okay. at a festival in the, um, the bullring, the Plaza de Torros. Um, but I'm only doing three songs. And um, what else? And you no, know, I got something, some work in the locally in Estepona near me, just me and my pianist. Uh, and the Spanish trio, we do, we've just been confirmed to do something in Tenerife in October. But as far as internationally is, is, is concerned, yeah. I've got this, all of my work, everything was canceled. A 22 date tour yeah. of Holland was canceled. 22. Yeah. Dates being yeah. paid per concert where everything was canceled. Ronnie's can't do Ronnie's because A, I don't want to do it now because they got plastic partitions between the tables now. And that's yeah. not no, that's not me. And my band, they don't want to do it either. And my band is is basically my rhythm section is the rhythm section for strictly. That is my band. Okay. So if they do go back to work and uh, go back and, and do strictly again this year then I won't be able to work with them from September until December. Right. You know, yeah. because they're doing strictly. And that's yeah. that's a, a seven day a week job for them. I mean, they work their butts off, all of them. Yeah. Dave Arch. Yeah. Dave Arch see, is my This is the reality keyboard. of the industry. These are the realities. And anybody yeah. that's thinking about getting into it, they've got to be prepared for moments like this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, um... So, um, but I've got um, the 31st... <coughs> Excuse me, 31st of August, um, a wedding that was actually bo originally booked for the 31st of May of last year, and it had to be canceled. Everything had to be canceled. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. big wedding as Global. well. Global. And, and I was, the groom wanted me there as a surprise, his surprise for the bride, because she came to see me at Ronnie's and said, um, oh, I'd one day I'd love to have her at one of my parties, blah, blah, blah. So he never told her that he booked me for it. Anyway, it's been rescheduled for the 31st of August. And I said to him, because this, the restrictions, everything changes, um, I have to wait until almost till the last minute before yeah. I can even book a flight. Because coming back to the UK, I'm, I'm now a resident of Spain. I've had my shots and everything, but you got to have shots before you leave, two days before you leave. Once you get there, you got to have shots. And, and uh, not until the 19th. Um, but you, people have had to quarantine for 10 to 14 days. And some in hotels, it costs a minimum 170 quid a day. You yeah. have to pay for that. You Somebody's making to, money from this. For they sure. are, people are rip, being ripped off left, right, and center, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm just waiting to find out when I can come over without having to quarantine and, and all yeah. of that. Because I stay with uh, friends of mine, which is wonderful. I don't have to stay in a hotel. So, you know, and then I saw that um, uh, people coming back from holidays, there's going to be a real, real crowd of people and um, they're understaffed at Heathrow. So they said the wait to get through passport control can be anything up to six hours. Yeah, it's kind of a daunting. Um, and I think they give you the worst case scenarios, but yeah. actually some people have been getting in and out okay. Um, yeah, and it's not too bad. So don't let it deter you. If it comes up, you can yeah. do it. Well, I've been I've been told by some friends to a don't don't come into Heathrow. So okay. if I do come back, I'll be I, because I can fly from Gibraltar because I'm only forty minutes from Gibraltar right. airport, and uh, I can fly from Gibraltar to Luton. Okay. Yeah, so I might do that, or from Malaga to Stansted. Right. Uh, I'd rather do Luton because Stansted, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Stansted is horrible. Yeah. But whenever you come back to London, we have to see you. Yeah. We have to see you. And I'm going to get Pearly together and Michael Brown. Yeah. And we will have to see you. Yeah. Oh, those are my girls. Yeah. 
And Ernestine. what about we have we the three of us have a mutual friend. Do you, uh, do you know Elaine Delma? El yeah, I do. Yeah. The four of us have a mutual friend named Bob. Okay. And and Bob um, moved to Northern Ireland last year. Right. And we all miss him so much. We sp would spend Christmas with him and he does the most wonderful Christmases. You know, I mean, he decorates the tree and does all the cooking and, and e everything. He makes such a fuss of us. The four of us, we make such a fuss of him. So we're all missing Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need friends like that, that's for sure. Oh, you need yeah, yeah. Like because I used to stay at Bob's house all the time um, in North London, but now he's gone and I miss okay. him so much. He's in Northern Ireland, but I've already, I told him, I've already booked my bedroom for Christmas. <laughs> I said, if no, no matter what, I'm going to try and spend Christmas with him. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Uh, he, he's just a dear, dear, dear friend to all of us, you know. Yeah. So he spoils the girls. Yes, he knows how to spoil us. <laughs> spoil the girls, yeah. Yeah. Well, Madeline, it has been an absolute pleasure and an honor to speak to a legend such as yourself. Living legend, see, this is it right here. I can talk, can I? I'd suddenly I know, but that's why you're here. If you couldn't talk, there'd be no point coming. And we've only talked about, I mean, what we've talked about is, is basically is like the tip of the iceberg. There'll be a part two. Okay, because there will yeah, definitely, definitely be a part because, two. Yeah, we have to do one with um, the people that I've done um, sessions, vocals for, like Joe Cocker, with yeah. a little help from my friends, John definitely. Lennon, Power to the People, uh, Elton John. Uh, uh, of course, Dusty, Rod Stewart, Long John Paul. This is this is just in in the UK. I mean, a, me a Donna yeah. Summer, me and Sue and Sonny, two more singers who are brilliant, wonderful singers. These two ladies, two sisters. Uh, we did so much stuff. We did Eurovision backing a German singer. You know, I mean, we there's so much. My history just is like <sighs> there's always every artist that I've interviewed. It's always been a part two, because when you've had such prolific careers, you cannot do it all in 45 minutes or an hour. You can't. Oh, no. So, you know, there will be a part two. So this is just part one. And okay. later on in the year, we will definitely have you back, honey. Okay. All right. <laughs> and you'll Lovely have to, to see me, you. You'll Thank have you to how to, so much. You'll have, you'll have to tell me how to connect again. <laughs> I'm, don't I'm worry don't worry it. we'll edit that bit out but you see now you've put that in so <laughs> yeah. there's nothing no, I can do I don't care I keep saying you know if you, you want to learn anything about computers ask a four-year-old <laughs> <laughs> absolutely but yeah. we made it in the end we yeah. made it so okay you take thank care thank you yourself. so much lovely to see you Aww. much appreciated and keep inspiring us all Okay, and I'll probably speak to Jonathan later because I told him I would call him because I love him. I love Jonathan and Glenn. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's such cool. beautiful people. Yeah, really yeah, he's cool. People. Yeah. Take anyway, care, you sweetie. take care of yourself, darling. Lots of love. Bye. Bye. Bye.